Hallelujah. So I want to go to a couple of scriptures today, this morning. God bless you today. Thank you for being here. Acts chapter 1. This is our theme verse. Acts chapter 1. I just want to warn you in advance. I feel like preaching today. I don't know if I ever came to a, a pulpit that I didn't feel like preaching, but I feel like preaching today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there any amen people in the house today? I hope it gets better than that down the road. Acts chapter 1. This is our theme verse, but I'm going to tie it into something different today. Acts chapter 1, verse number 13. And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room. Somebody shout the upper room. They went to the upper room where they were staying, and that is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, and then went on through the disciples there. Verse number 14, these all with one mind were continually voted, devoting themselves to prayer and with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Notice that there was a connection to prayer. They were devoting themselves and they weren't a bunch of independent minds. They're one mind. The church don't need a bunch of independent minds. We need the mind of Christ. And that, that, means, that means we have to cross through all kinds of ideologies. We have to cross through different experiences. We have to cross borders of ethnicities. We have to cross, uh, cross over through cultural borders. Do you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only message in the world that you can take worldwide and you don't have to try to learn somebody else's culture to help them understand the gospel? Because the gospel will cross into every ethnic background. You can, you can, be, in, you can be in Bangladesh and not understand the language, but be in a praise service and feel the same God in Bangladesh that you can feel right here. You can be in China and don't know anything about their language, anything about their culture, but when you see believers gathered together, lifting up their hands, worshiping, praising God, you don't have to give a, you don't have to give a, a dissertation on how to understand their culture because the gospel crosses culture. Now look with me in chapter 2, verse number 1 of Acts. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Somebody shout, one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Somebody just shout fire one time. Fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance, and now they were living in, 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 in living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation, every ethnicity under heaven, every ethnos, every tribe, every culture, every kindred. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, and they were bewildered. Our word that we used last Sunday in the Message Bible, they were thunderstruck, because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language because the gospel can penetrate every ethnicity. It crosses over. It puts everybody on the same page at the same time in the same place. Now, I want to show you something here. I want you to run all the way back over with me to Leviticus and the Old Testament there. Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 6, verse number 8. And it says, And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law for the burnt offerings. And the burnt offering itself shall remain on the earth, or remain on the hearth, on the altar all night until the morning. And the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. And the priest is to put on his linen robe, and he shall put on his undergarments next to his flesh, 
and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire reduces the burnt offerings on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he shall take the garments and put on the other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it, and it shall not go out. But the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and they shall lay and they shall lay out the burnt offering on it, and offer up and smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. Last verse, number thirteen. And the fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. The fire on the altar was a reminder of God's presence and God's power. And the fire was never supposed to go out. This is what we've been talking about. We've been talking about everybody needs an upper room experience. My subtitle this morning is, Don't Let the Fire Go Out. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, if you got some fire, don't let it go out. If you're going to burn, you might as well burn for God. Now, I want to I wanna help you. I, wanna let, I want you to really help me prophesy that into the atmosphere. Push on about two other people that you don't even know if they want you to push on them or not and tell them, keep the fire burning. Come on, tell them, keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. Don't let it go out. Don't let it go out. Don't let it go. If the church ever needs to keep the fire burning, it's today. Can't find no amens now. Where y'all at? We got to keep the fire burning. The fire has to stay lit. In Jesus' name, let me pray. Father, we thank you this morning for what you're going to do in this place. Holy Spirit, you're the preacher, the teacher, the communicator. You're the revelator of all truth. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in hearts and minds. Thank you for what you're doing in people's lives. Lord, I pray today as we gather for the next few moments over the Word of God, thank you for what you're going to do even in our midst. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Even on Father's Day, something significant is going to happen in people's lives. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen, amen, and amen, and amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated. In our passage of Scripture today, we find where God is, uh, in, in the book of Levit Leviticus there, God is speaking to Moses about keeping the fire burning, keeping the fire lit on the altar of the Lord. And during this particular time when God was speaking to Moses, the children of Israel was in the wilderness. They were in a, a desert. And what was meant to be just an 11-day journey had now turned into a 40-year wandering. But what had captured my attention whenever I was reading that uh, the, is the fact that they were on this journey, they were in this journey in a desert, a wilderness, but God was still talking to them. It doesn't ever matter how bad it gets. It doesn't ever matter how bad, difficult things become. God is still speaking, and God still speaks in tough places. In the midst of everything that's going on, even in our world, the church needs to be confident today that there is a word from God, and God is still speaking in the midst of the turmoil. In the desert, they, had, they were dwelling in tents, and not houses, because the desert was only a temporary place. It was not a place of permanence. It was just temporary. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we will try to build a house in a temporary season that God is just trying to move us through, and we end up getting stuck in a season that was only meant to be temporary, and we end up building things that are permanent in a temporary location. And I don't know about you, but ladies and gentlemen, I believe with all of my heart, while they were in that place, God had not abandoned them. God had not forsaken them. God had not left them. 
They were in a place, and God was letting them know you're just journeying through a difficult moment in your life, but the heavens are not quiet. I am not quiet. I have my eye on the middle of the subject, and I am speaking to my people. I'm speaking to my church, and if the church can hear the voice of God in the midst of the chaos, if the church can learn to hear the voice of God in the midst of the hurt, that's what my wife was praying about, in the midst of the hurt, the pain, if the church can learn how that, the, how that heaven is declaring something different than your mainstream news media, heaven is declaring something different than your favorite somebody, Heaven is declaring that in the midst of the craziness, in the midst of the turmoil, there's going to be a powerful working of the Holy Ghost. And, and, and when God gets finished with everything that he started, it's going to look better than it was before we ever got to it. Come on, tell somebody, keep the fire burning. I'm going to keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. You have to understand today, I'm going to preach in a minute, I feel this thing. We are in a moment. We are in a moment in time. And if the church can recognize the time in which we are living in, if the church can begin to recognize the moment that we have been called to, the moment that we find ourselves living in, we can step into that moment with boldness of speech and begin to leverage our faith into a different day and begin to take what the enemy meant for harm and turn it around and bring some good out of it because the church is the only legalized entity on the planet that can solve the problems on the planet. The church is the only legalized entity that God gave power over doctrines of devils. He gave power over principalities and powers. God didn't give that power to governments. God didn't give that power to, 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 to organizations. God gave that power to the church because the church is the only one that can lead it. The church is the only one that can model right behavior. The church is the only one that can step in chaos and say, peace, be still. Come on, tell somebody to keep the fire burning. Keep the fire. You got to keep the fire. You got to keep the fire burning. We're living in a moment of time that I believe. Now, let me just say a little bit about this. The church has to be careful how we say things and where we say things and the context of how we say things. Now, let me qualify that. I'm not intimidated to preach truth. I'm not intimidated to preach truth. And when it comes across your radar, you have to deal with it however the Holy Ghost deals with it to you. I, my every, hey, listen, every word I speak from this pulpit is held in check every single time I speak. I'm not just held in check by people in here or people in, 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 in watching online. I'm held in check by accountable of people that are over me, that watch over me. They hold me accountable because every word I preach has to line up with the word of God. And, but I am not intimidated to tell people this is what God says. This is what the Bible says. And it makes no difference to me if you can't line up with your ideology. It makes no difference to me if you can't get it right because the word of God is what's truth. The word of God is what crosses all over the word of God is what heals the word of God is what touches the word of God is what blesses the word of God is what multiplies and the word of God is the truth of God's word and we have to be careful because we're living in a time we're living in a time where we are trying to downgrade the Bible downgrade the word of God and put a social issues in the context of a social situation. And you cannot deal with social issues apart from the word of God. Martin Luther King said it himself. He said, if the gospel does not deal with the social issues, then the gospel is not the gospel. The gospel is what deals with social issues. It's the gospel that goes into the areas that are in conflict, into the areas of chaos, and it begins to build the bridge. It builds the highway. It comes to the, the chaotic moments of our life. It brings the peace of God. It brings the revelation of God, and it brings the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We have to be careful that we don't align our words with the, pro with the false prophets of our day. In my opinion, the false prophets of our day is the mainstream media. It's the mainstream media. 
It's the false prophets of our day. And I, you ain't, I, I, don't, I don't have to even qualify that. You can, you can Google any of them and you can find them all lying. There's a lie in every one of them. They twist the narrative to bend it to their fact so that they can get more ratings because more ratings create more money. But the word of God is true. In fact, let every man be a liar. Let every devil be a liar. But let the word of God whoo, be found true. We had to be careful. And I know we're living, we're, living, we're living in the day of information. There's so much stuff out there. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. If the church ever needs to be Bible savvy, if the church ever needs to know the word of God, it's today. It's today. We, look, over, over, over 90% of college students that say, go off to a major university get talked out of their faith before their sophomore year because of the professors that are there, which is another form of false prophets, because they squeeze their ideology in between the ears of those students. And when you put a student into the, into the platform of those ideologies and they don't have an understanding of God's word in their own heart, if they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ in their own heart, if their own heart has not de been developed and discipled according to the word of God, they get talked out of their faith. What's running anarchy in our streets right now, I'm not talking about protests. I'm talking about the anarchy that's running in our streets right now is the ideology of professors that have put it into college students and it's running wild in our nation. And I'm just trying to tell you, you you can't fix that with just a poem. You can't fix that with just a speech. You can't fix that with a handshake. You got to fix it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to have a word in the middle of the chaos. So we understand today that, that while they were in this place, God was speaking. God was speaking while they were in the wilderness. God was speaking while they were in a tough place. God was speaking his word over them about his presence, about his power, and about his glory. Everybody has had their stats about our nation and our culture. But I'm not responding to the stats. Stats can change. <laughs> Everybody is prophesying their word. To the culture. But I want to prophesy God's word to the culture. I want to speak God's life into the middle of a culture that has gone crazy. In a culture that has absolutely abandoned the faith of God. We have to know today, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world, we live in America now that is no more God friendly. And I believe that even like in Ezekiel's day, Ezekiel 37. There's a word from God to a bunch of bones that are disconnected and scattered. I believe today our world is disconnected and scattered. But I believe there's a word for the division. I believe there's a word for the divide. Come on, if the church don't get this, our, wor our world has no hope. There's a word for the division. There's a word for the division. And, it's, and listen, and you don't have to, I don't have to keep qualifying this, but when you watch mainstream media, their number one agenda is to create division. And I don't care what network it is. Every network creates division with their rhetoric. Only the church can hear what heaven is saying and step into the division and change the rhetoric of culture, change the rhetoric of the news media and put a word from God on it and see the bones come back together again. See the disconnection come back together again. See them come back together as a mighty army that begin to stand on their feet. And Ezekiel said, I prophesied as the Lord had commanded me. And when I prophesied, there was a movement. There was a rattling. There was a shaking. Can I just tell you, ladies, oh, I feel like preaching. I just believe that the church is about to come alive. The church is about to preach. The church is about to declare. The church is about to prophesy. And we're going to speak to the division that's in our land. 
land. We're going to speak to the hatred that's in our land. We're going to speak to the bigotry that's in our land. We're going to speak to the prejudice that's in our land. We're going to speak to the racism that's in our land. And we're going to watch the bones get connected to the bone. And we're going to watch what has been separated, divided. And we're going to come together as a mighty army. And the voice of God is going to be resounded across America again until every devil is held captive. Push on somebody and tell them let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. That's why you cannot be intimidated. Oh, my Lord, I feel this. I was talking to Bishop yesterday afternoon. I said, Bishop, just help me out because he, he called me and we were talking about some other things. I said, Bishop, there is such a spirit of intimidation on churches right now. Churches are scared to gather. They're scared to put people together. They're scared to do every, anything. They're scared, to, they're scared to, 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 to march out and preach truth. They're scared. They're intimidated. And I said, but I feel something different. I feel something different in the realm of the spirit period because I don't believe that God has called us to sit in our little corner and keep our little mouth shut while our nation is going to hell in a handbasket when the church has the ability to bring some unified cases back to people so that we can begin to unify the people of God again I'm not worried about the world being divided I'm talking about the church being divided the biggest hindrance in our nation it's not the sin of the world. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I'm not worried about the sin of the nation. I'm worried about the sin of the church. I'm not worried about the nation being offended of, about the church. I'm worried about the church being offended of the nation that they're called to change. That's why the church has to have a voice. That's why, that's why the church has to be on point with the social issues and not say, well, that's just them. No, that's the church. That's the body of Christ. And when we unite together, we are better in unity than we are divided. There's a movement in our land to shut the church down, to stomp out the fire. So that the fire is no longer lit in our churches. There's a movement in our land to usurp authority. And begin to push the church. Listen, some of y'all think some of this quarantine and pandemic, y'all think, think that's just all got to do with, 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 the, with the coronavirus. I'm telling you, that's got to do with an agenda to shut the church down. You think that coronavirus just came over here? No, that coronavirus was sitting here. It was planted here. It was planted here as a pandemic to shut the world down, to shut the economy down. It was planted in our nation. And you say, well, it's just a virus. No, it was planted here. It was planted here so that they knew that ultimately if they could shut the church down, they'll keep the world in the palm of their hands because the church, again, is the only legalized entity on the planet to overthrow the spirit of darkness. The church is the only legalized entity. Let me just say this because our church cultures have been so indoctrinated into worldly cultures that we try to fit a worldly mindset into a kingdom culture. And the kingdom culture gets reduced to whatever the worldly mindset is. The gospel of the kingdom is not intimidated to invade enemy held territory. And when the gospel of the kingdom gets released into enemy-held territory, it has to back up. It has to let go. It has to flee. I had a pastor call me a couple weeks ago. And, and, and I, I respect, there's a lot of, we got, I got friends that are watching me now. They're, and I know some of them places, their, their governors won't let them meet they, without a fine, without being arrested. Here's my take on it. Get arrested. Get arrested. Take a stand. Can't find no hell. Got a little bit here. We're going to take a stand. Take a stand. My God. I mean, it, I mean, take a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This ain't no cruise ship, baby. This is a battleship. We are built for war. We are built to invade. We are built to go into the darkness and push the light. We got churches that are 
that are that are shut down. We, we, we were talking to somebody the other day. My wife was, and 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 and, and it has nothing to do with anything but scared. You said, "What are you you you, you just going to jeopardize?" Listen, we ain't jeopardizing nobody. You go to Walmart, you done jeopardize yourself. Unless food's been delivered to your house, you have jeopardized yourself. You get gas, you go to work, you go to, you think that little three by three plexi screen glass, you, you, you're going you're gonna to buy all your items and slide, it, slide them under the plexiglass and then they're going to slide it back to you after they done handled every item you putting in your home. And you think that, you, I'm just telling you, it's crazy. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm trying to say, if the church don't wake up, if the power of God don't rise up, the church will be quarantined and shut down, and the powers of hell will rule and invade like nobody's business. Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel said, I, been, I began to prophesy. And I prophesied as I was commanded. I didn't prophesy my own thoughts. I didn't prophesy my own ideologies. I didn't prophesy the way I was feeling. <laughs> Let me say, I just feel lead. Let me give you some lead. Let me give you a sinker. Put some lead. That's how you get lead. He was prophesying, thus saith the Lord. I want to ask the question, because I'm trying to help this church understand. I want this church to know Racism don't fit in here. It don't fit in here. And I, I, I had, I had a, I, when I was talking to Bishop yesterday, he said, he, said, he said a lot of churches won't deal with it. I said, that ain't no, I said, we've been dealing with it for 30 years. Listen, if you have set any length of time in, in, under my preaching, you have heard me deal with racism. If you ever came to a Tuesday night prayer meeting, you know we deal with it continuously. I had somebody challenge me a couple weeks ago because our church is multi-ethnic, multi-racial. We're not multi-culture. We have one culture. That's the kingdom. We are not multi-culture. Because when you get born again, you change allegiance. In fact, does not the Bible say we, are, we have been delivered out of the domain of darkness and into his marvelous light? When I became born again, I changed my allegiance. I changed my allegiance to my party affiliation. I changed my allegiance to my skin color. I changed my allegiance to my doctrines and, de and denominations. My allegiance is to the king. Woo. Hallelujah. And so we have to understand that in the midst of the chaos, God's speaking. God's speaking. In the middle of all the negativity, God's saying something. In the middle of all the chaos, the division, and the disorder, God is saying something. There's not a day since the pandemic has started which is in early March, and there's not a day since the death of George Floyd a few weeks ago that I have not been on the phone with pastors and leaders from all over America from every different ethnic background that you can imagine. We're not just trying to promote an idea. We're, tr we're trying to promote God's agenda in the midst of chaos. And I just want to say this, and I'm just being honest with I, I came with a, a bunch of notes here, but I felt the Holy Ghost say to me earlier this morning, before I even got here, he said, just be ready to move when I move. And I, I, I've, got, I've got a problem with any preacher or pastor that's called to deliver God's word, and you get intimidated by the people you're called to lead. Because your allegiance is not to the people. Your allegiance is to love them but fear God. But we got too many people in the pulpits that love God 
and fear the people. You cannot preach the truth of God's word and worry about everybody's little attitude. Because <laughs> I promise you, everybody here has an attitude situation going on at times. At times. I have been talked about, lied about, you name it. I've been doing this long enough that I don't care. I used to worry. I used to care when people would say something bad about me. But, but, but God would say to me, if you preach in my word, they ain't your problem. Let me show you a couple things here. Because I feel like preaching in a minute. But I won't run out of time. Boy, y'all have to come back next Sunday. I keep saying that every week, don't I? Y'all better keep coming. <laughs> Not too long ago, there was a, uh, a research group called the Global Research Company. They came up with these crazy conclusions about the upcoming generations between the ages of 15 and 30. They said this. This will be on the screen for you. They said that this generation would be the last viable generation to advance the cause of Christianity. They said after this century, Christianity would not be able to survive in a viable, sustainable manner. This is what they came up with their research. They said th that this particular research group said, declared that this is the last chapter of Christendom. Now, that, those are facts. That's not, that not somebody not making it up. Those are genuine facts. But that's, a, that's the direction that our world can head in if the church don't rise up. If the church don't rise up and begin to reproduce itself, then it very well may be the last opportunity, not of the gospel, the gospel has outlasted every tyrant, every dictator, every enemy of its origins. The gospel has been alive for 2,000 years. It has outlasted everything. But the problem is, do we want to live in a world where the gospel is not present? We are seeing now in this generation the first fruits of seeds that have been sown into a previous generation. We are witnessing before our eyes right now seeds of dishonor that have been sown and the exaltation of bad behavior has been glorified. Got one person. Thank you, baby. Stay with me. It's Father's Day. I appreciate it. We're living in a day where reality stars Pop stars, rock stars, music stars have promoted bad behavior, and we have called it normal. We have called as vile as it is, and you know it goes across everything that we believe in our core. But because it's so prevalent, because it's so out there, and because experts back it up on the news media, we think it's the gospel. We, have now, we, have, we now have people in positions of authority who should be leading our nation, but instead they're acting like children at a cafeteria food fight. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. I'm going down that road. Because we are a nation that has lost its honor. Pastor Mark was preaching a while ago, Sharon. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added done to you. When you no longer honor the king, you won't honor nobody else. When the king is not honored in your life, when he is not preeminent in your life, then nobody else will be. Because only God can teach you to love people that ain't like you. Only God can teach you to forgive people when they've done something bad to you. Does not your Bible say, blessed are those that are persecuted? Yes. Did not Jesus say, pray for those who persecute you? Right. You can't do that apart from Christ. Right. You can't do it. You can't do it. You'll hold something in your heart. It'll turn into a root of bitterness, and it'll get down inside your soul, and it'll open up the door to, to every evil known work. 
It's what your Bible says. And so now here we have a nation that has glorified bad behavior. We have sown seeds of dishonor. And we got leaders sitting in high places. We got authority sitting in high places when they should be leading our nation into unity, into strength. But they're standing there and they're bickering back and forth from one aisle to the other aisle. And they're pointing fingers and they're blaming each other. I'm just saying we ought to get you out of there and get some people in there that know how to promote unity, promote, know how to promote no, I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you, you, we, 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 we've watched our nation stay divided like it's never been divided before. And I got to tell you, who's driving that narrative? Who's driving that value system? Who's driving that thought? And if the church don't rise up and speak back to it, it will continue its evil known work. We now have a, a, a culture of dishonor. It's a culture of dishonor. In, in fact, the ones that are in anarchy now, and I'll just keep protesting, uh, saying this because I don't want nobody thinking I'm, I'm against protesting. I'm not against protesting because things do need to change. I'm not against healthy protesting. Our nation was built on protest. But now we got a culture that's trying to overthrow that has hijacked, hijacked good protesting. And they've turned it into anarchy. We got outside groups that come into a good protest that are just wanting to see the systems change, to see the right things happen. And then they hijack and they start burning buildings. You think that's an accident? No, they're paid to do that. They're paid by an organization to do that. They're paid to be there. They're paid to disrupt it. It's just so in dishonor and chaos. In these things, and now, now, now we have a nation that, that I mean, a, a bunch of people in our culture is called cancel culture. Come on. Cancel culture. Like, like, let's do away with our past. There are some things that we do need to do away with, but you can't forget it. Because it ought to be a reminder that you don't ever want to go back there again. You can't cancel history. You can't cancel. I, I, I don't, listen, I don't care how many statues you take down and burn and overthrow. You, you can't cancel history. You can't eradicate it. The problem, what's going on in our nation right now, is we've got two or three generations that have been raised in an ideological, ideology present driven culture. When the government system took over the education, the first thing that they began to work was take away accurate history. So now we got students that are not being taught history. Don't teach them where they came from, how they got here. So now you got a bunch of anarchy people running around saying we don't need history. Yeah, you do. Because not, they're, they're, and let's just go there. Part of our history was really bad. The slave days was really horrible. It's a mark on our nation. And we understand that. But you can't erase it. But it reminds me, every time I hear the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King, every time I hear the testimonies of those who overcame, something that gets inside my spirit, and I say, God, thank you for people that were driving the agenda of righteousness in the midst of darkness. And it makes me say, God, don't ever let my heart go back to that place. Don't ever let me be a generation that fuels the fire to take us back to a place that was totally ungodly. So you can't cancel it. Amen. Cancel culture. What a lofty idea. What an idiotic statement. Amen. The power of forgiveness does this. It don't take away your memory. It takes away the stain of it. The Bible says that God doesn't remember our sins. Understand the context of what he's saying. It's not that he can't remember. He just chooses not to let it be a stain against you in his eyes. We got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. People ugly. 
mean-spirited. I'm trying to put it on a PG rating here so y'all don't get mad at me. We have sown such hostility and we have dislodged the moral bearing of an entire generation. I grew up right here in Quilston. Some of my best friends are not white. In fact, I've been in fights with more white people <laughs> than I have other ethnic groups. That's the truth. I ain't making that's a true statement. <laughs> Believe me, I'm your pastor. <laughs> I grew up right here in the city of Quilston. It's my land. It's my territory. It's what I'm giving my life for. I'll bleed for this city. Others can run away and flee it. Talk about it. Not this man. Because there's some good people of every ethnic group in this city. Some good people. And I'm not ashamed to side with anybody that's on truth. But you ain't going to drag me in your corner of dishonor. You ain't going to drag me in your corner of hate. Just because you can't get rid of it out of your heart don't mean I'm going to put it in my heart. Just because you can't get beyond the conviction of the Holy Ghost and you're going back to experiences and upbringings. You're not going to push that in my heart. Let me just say it for the record, because this is going out everywhere. As long as I got breath in my body, you ain't going to push it in this house. You ain't going to do it. It won't happen. There's too much at stake. There's too many people that need Jesus. And you can't get it with a church that's divided that's over right. politics. Come on. Come on. Injustices. Come on. Somebody asked me today, who are you voting for? I said, ain't none of your business. <laughs> I said, but I promise you when I vote, it'll be as closest to the heart of God that you can get without right. naming a name. Can I just tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? I know we, we have to do politics. I know it. We do. And, and people have to choose sides. But you know what? Even in this house, you just need to be aware not everybody thinks like you think. And maybe somebody's on a journey and they're believing some ways. And maybe they don't believe like you believe. Or maybe they don't have as much information as you have. It don't make them evil. I got friends right now that are preaching the gospel. I'm like, in my own mind, my head, I'm thinking, you're about as lost as anybody I ever known when it comes to politics. You don't have a clue. But it don't make them bad people. But you know what it does make me do? It makes me pray for people. Because the more I pray for people, the less I'm bothered by their ideologies. Because I do believe some people are on a journey and they're trying to get there. But they're not going to get there if we're making them out to be something less than. Because they don't believe the way we believe. Does God judge? better believe he does are we are we to judge absolutely right. only not the intrinsic value of a person's worth right. we don't judge that right. i can judge your fruit i can judge your actions right. but i can't judge your worth That's right. only god can do that
And when the church understands the flow and the power, I'm saying all this because it's, in, it's, 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 it's trying to rise up in the church. I understand the world is divided, but God help us that the church gets divided. And the truth is the church has been divided for many years. For many years. And, a, and, and the hardest thing to do is to move people together in unity over something that's common. The Bible says in the book of Acts, they were all in one accord and in one mind, in one place. Isn't it amazing? The fire found the ones who were in one mind. The fire didn't find the ethnicity of each group. It found the minds that were together and unified on him. We got a lot of work to do. I get it. But we're not going to cancel culture. We're going to invade it. We have, boy, is that clock right? We ain't even going to have time to give away the gifts. Lord. We'll do Father's Day next week, too. I, I know we need to go. God, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize what time it was. We have sown seeds into our children for the last this is where I was going with the whole mountain of government and education and I thank God there's people in education here Amen. that honestly believe in their heart they can take that mountain that's what I'm throwing my weight behind because it's been hijacked by a government that was ungodly because now we have seeds sown into a generation of two different generations that have been raised up, which they had told them that they came from monkeys. And then we act surprised when they act like it. You told them. You told them. You told them you were nothing but a, you, you, you came from, look, there's a monkey swinging in a tree. That's your uncle. We told them. I remember, them, I, I remember when it started and when I, I was coming out of school, when it was beginning to make its way into our school here, when evolution began to make its way here. You remember the little chart? Remember the little chart? Started out like a little monkey. He crawling around on his all fours. Next thing you know, he's kind of squatting a little bit. Next thing he's walking upright. They put that into our heads, said we came from a bunch of monkeys because we're nothing but mere animals. And then now we act so surprised when people are on the streets, burning buildings, killing people, hijacking people, murdering people, and they're acting like monkeys. Oh, my God, what happened? You created a system that made them think like that. You created the system. Ah. People, we, we, we got Seattle locked down six blocks. We're going to create our own world. Okay, in your own world, you build a fence and you put armed guards in it. That was wrong when somebody else was doing it, but it's okay when you do it. Anarchy. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. I know I'm, I know I'm on it. Because in your mind, in your mind, I'm talking about not your mind, I'm talking about in, in, in their mind. Let me put it that way. In their mind. And listen, if you think I'm talking about color people, you have lost your ever-living mind. There's as much white people on the streets that are burning buildings and killing people as there are of another ethnicity. You have lost your mind if you're thinking I'm making it a white and black thing. This is the nature and the culture that our systems have created it, and only the church can fix it. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Our society, let me, I, I need to quit. Come on, Pastor Port. I need to, my Lord, it's 12, it's 12 o'clock. Can y'all believe that? And his father said, I got y'all need to go. Come on, Pastor Ford, come on, worship team, if y'all don't mind. In our society, we are so desperate to disconnect man from God that we don't even realize how ridiculous the theory is. Because in our society, we have created these agendas. And this is my point. This is where I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the fire. We'll get there. 
someday. We're going to get to the fire. If the church don't recognize the agendas and begin to pray against them. Pastor Mark made a, made a valid point. Tuesday night prayer is not just for a little handful of people that just really feel spiritual. We don't gather here on Tuesday night because we don't have nothing better to do. We gather here on Tuesday night because we understand that prayer is the only thing that can move things. Prayer is the only thing that can open up atmospheres and powers and territories so that the church can begin to invade it. So we pray. So we come and we pray. We come and we cry out to God. We come and we ask God, let the heavens be open. Let the church be filled with power. Let the church have some boldness. Let the church have some strength. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the time to grow weary in well-doing. Our world needs the church. Our world needs us. And I know there's some people that are going on, probably starting vacations right now, and I get that, and I'm all for that. Many of us are going to be going on vacations, and I thank God for it, but I want to tell you something. The church still ain't here yet. Mm -hmm. We got people that are not gathering, but you know why? Because they have been so out of touch from gathering that it's no longer a priority. That's not unity. So we have dislodged the moral compass of a generation. I and mean, you can't blame it. I'm not talking about the protests. I'm talking about the anarchy. You can't just look at them and be mad at them. Somebody taught them to think that way. Our systems have taught them to think that way. And, and, and I bet if you did a survey, if you did a survey across the board, I bet you over 90% of them didn't even have a father figure in their house. Because stability begins in the house. It begins in the home. Dads, hear me. That's why you need to be in church with your kids. I heard, I heard Denzel Washington, I know we're going to go. I heard Denzel Washington say this on an interview. A, 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 a black pastor friend of mine sent it to me. He said, man, I want you to hear this guy. He said, I just want you to hear what he said. And it just so struck me. He said, Denzel Washington was being interviewed. And, and he said, what do you think the issue is in the African-American home right now? He said, when I was growing up, he said, I had three best friends. All three of my friends are in prison right now, and I'm not. He said, the difference between me and my three friends was in my house, I had a dad. In their house, they did not. He said, because the system's not locking up seven-year-olds, but it will deal with 15-year-olds. I'm just saying, there's a lot to fix. That's why the church has to lead the way. Because the systems are either broke or they've been hijacked. And now we have a nation that's in chaos. With a nation who claims, 80% of our nation claims they believe in God. 80% of it. But you can't keep Bible in school. You can't keep prayer in school. And you can't keep the Ten Commandments on the wall. Because the system has hijacked a value system. A system has hijacked a value system of our nation. Which is the belief in God. So here it is. The further you remove God out of society, the more chaos you manifest. When you remove God, you don't just remove an entity or a name. You remove a value system. That's why I say let the church rise. Let the church get on fire. Let the church put some pushback on it. Let the church lead the way. Let the church demonstrate reconciliation. 
Let the church demonstrate love. Let the church demonstrate forgiveness. Amen? Then, the fire will fall. And it falls on the altar. In the Old Testament, it was a physical altar. In our day, it's the altar of our heart. I'm just trying to say today, I know we got to go. Come on, just stand to your feet. I, we, we, we'll go. Oh, my Lord, I'm so sorry. I didn't even get where I needed to go. Is this all right, though? Is it all right? I really, I really got to, I, I really, this, 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 I'm telling you, we'd have been throwing chairs if I'd have got to this next page here. Because that's where the church is headed. Because I believe the fire of God's going to fall. I believe the glory of God's going to rise. And I believe the church is going to lead the way with such strength, such power, such authority. How, I don't know, but I got, I got people in this area, and I got loved ones. I, listen, I'm telling you, I got some crazy jacked up love, loved ones in this area, but I believe the fire of God's going to fall on them. I believe the fire of God. I'm telling you, when the revival hits the church, revival will hit the land. Revival will move. So it's got to be our prayer. It's got to be our heart. Lift your hands right there where you are just for a moment all over the building. God, we pray this morning. God, that we won't ever have a disconnect from those things that you value. Lord, there are spirits of aggression, spirits that have been unleashed over our nation, unlike we have ever seen in our generation. The ideology that's been born out of the pits of hell has been released like a blanket over our nation. And it's forming culture into something that has no use for God. God, I pray this morning that we as the people of God will not be intimidated to love, will not be intimidated to reach, will not be intimidated to live it out, live out the gospel of Jesus Christ so that the world around us can have a different value system. Lord, that we will begin to do, a, do an inspection of our own heart. God, if there's any wicked thing in me, show me, God. If there's anything in my heart that's not right, reveal it so that I can make it right. God, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we just thank you that there is a spirit of Christ that's moving. There is a spirit of reconciliation that's happening. And Father, we declare, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Lord, I thank you that there is something prepared on the other side of the chaos. There's something that's prepared on the other side of the stuff that's going on that's better than what we're in. God, I thank you for the spirit of Christ that's going to rise and the church is going to lead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we're going to lead. We're going to come together in one mind and one accord till the fire of your presence fall on our altars. Let the fire of your presence fall on our altars again, God. Let it burn in our hearts again until we are consumed with the fire. God, we won't let it go out. Come on, stir that over yourself. Say, God, I'm not going to let it go out. I'm not going to let it go out. I'm not going to let it go out. There's too much at stake. There's too much that we have to believe for. Stir up the fire. Stir up the fire. Lord, until we become pa passionate. Until we step out of passivity. Step into a movement. Step into an outpouring. Come on, I feel the weariness. This is where we have to fight the most. Speak the loudest. Okay. God. Let justice roll. Let justice flow. Let systems change. May the power of the gospel. There's neither bond or free, Jew nor Greek, male or female. We are all one, one in Christ. 
Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. You say, well, I don't know if I need to pray. I'm just saying pray. I feel the Holy Ghost. We're shifting something over our region. We're shifting something over our territory. Mindsets are being shifted. Let the church rise. Let the church rise. Let the church rise. Let the church rise. I refuse to be offended. I refuse to harbor up anything that's not of God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Fire fall. Fire come. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, somebody just look at somebody and tell them we're gonna let the fire fall. We're gonna let it fall. Come on, tell them we're gonna let it. We're gonna let it fall. We're gonna let it. We're gonna let it. We're gonna let it fall. We're gonna let it fall. We're gonna let it fall. Yes. Because see, when the fire comes, things get burned up. About that next week, I guess. We're going to go. Who, who's doing? Jesse, Pastor Jesse, Pastor Corey, you guys come on. When I was a kid growing up, I used to ride the bus out of Gulfview to school. And I remember as a kid, oh man, there went all the tickets. There went Jet. Yeah, well, you can't, you, can't, you can't cheat now. They all messed up. Everyone behind you. I remember in school, when I rode the bus, we had a bus stop right here on one corner, back in there behind my parents' house. It was just a dirt road back in those days. And I can remember while we were there early in the morning waiting on the bus, we had run down to the next corner of the block and look around that corner because you could see the bus turn off the backside over there where Stanton Mobile Home is. They come off the highway because they'd been in the flag hole or whatever and they was coming down the back way. My best friend Donald Williams right there. You remember those days, Donald? We'd, we'd run down there. Miss McDuffie used to, was our bus driver. Lord, how do I remember that? Miss McDuffie. And, 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 and when she turn off 27 and turn in right there at Stanton's Mobile Home on that first road there in the Gulf View, they'd come down that back road. We'd come all the way down to the corner by Miss Endicott's house. Not Miss Endicott, Miss, uh, what's her name on that corner? I forgot her name. Miss Endicott. Okay, that's for another day. But we, we'd stand, just little kids, we'd stand there, and we'd see that bus turn off 27. And we saw it coming, we'd turn, and it's coming down our road. And we'd get so excited. And we'd run all the way back to our bus stop because we had seen the bus coming. You couldn't see it coming from the bus stop. You had to move in the direction that the bus was traveling. That's the picture of the church. God is coming in, but you ain't going to get him in your stale, stuck, crazy, ideological, jacked up, messed up self. The church is going to have to run to the corner. Put some expectation. There it is. There it comes. And then run back to the house of God and celebrate. The power is coming. The glory is coming. The, 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 the lifter of my head is coming. There is some glory that's about to come and take us to a destination that eyes have not seen. Come on, somebody get excited that the glory bus, the glory bus is coming. It don't look like it now, but it is coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's coming. It's coming. It don't look like it now because we're scattered. We're divided. But God's speaking. God's speaking. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Because we're about to rally together. Amen. I'm sorry I took way much of your time on Father's Day. I love you. I love you with all my heart. God bless you. 
Amen. Y'all give it up for Pastor Chuck. Yeah. All right, you guys ready for some prizes? You can take a seat. Hey, before we get started, you know how we were on that, that dad jokes earlier. I got a real good one. Okay. Uh, this is for you. Okay. I might know the How answer. does Moses start his day? He brews some coffee. He brews a cup of coffee. That's right. He brews a cup. That was too easy. God, I tried. See, I'm just not good at it. All right, so we got some, we got some gifts we want to give to you guys. Are you all excited for that? No? Yeah. yeah, we got a couple over here. All right, so we're going to start. We got a whole variety here. I get to give away the first one here. Now, our first one is a, I'm going to mess it up, a Jimmy, Jimmy Choo men's cologne. I have no idea what that is, but I'm sure it's going to smell good. It's going to smell good on Chew, okay? <laughs> it's going to smell good on Chew. All right, so who's got their tickets? I hope tickets. you got one. It should have been just the fathers. All right. So here's the first one, Pastor Corey. 104-6414. 104-6414. How's this work out? Six, we give four, these one, out. Four. Oh, all right. Brother Billy. Brother Billy. Yes. We got some cologne that's going to smell good on you. Go ahead. I'll bring it to you, brother. Yeah, we'll bring it to you. Now, just so you know, if you get the grill, if you want to work it out and come back and get it later or tomorrow, better yet, tomorrow or something, we'll work that out down the road. Brother Bill, did you check that ticket? You know, I mean. It's, it's legit. It's legit. All right, here's the next one. Our Pastor next Corey. prize right here is a Vince Camuto watch. I think that's right. With changeable bands and a pair of sunglasses. All right. Very nice. Here we go. One zero four six four one two. Six four, four one, one two. two. That's you. Yep. Come on up, he brother. Said, he said, "Yep." Like he's at an auction or something. You bidding on this? All right. You got you a nice watch. Thank you. All right. Six four one two. I see it. I got All your right. next one right here. Next one. You read it. All right. He he drew it, not me. So we got this this blue igloo cooler here. It's full of all kind of goodies. Yes. Uh, this has Chips Ahoy, so Timmy, it's not for you. You won them double stuffs. Hopefully you don't win this one. It's got all kinds of stuff. It's even got a, a pack of worms or something in there yep. if you fish. So we got 104 6397. 6397. So that's you. All right. Here we this go. You got cooler, you a cooler. Brother. Some Mountain Dew for energy. I know you got kids. You're going to need it. It helps. And if you fish, you got um, some Strike Kings in there. Strike King. You, we can get it. Come on up. Well, let's yeah. just check your ticket. We can give it to you after. Uh, after. Oh, you, you need some help. You happy? <laughs> Come here. Let me show you what you get to eat on right here. You get to have all that. I think okay? she had a birthday yesterday, too, right? Oh, this week. We can get it after service if, if you want. Or you can wheel it. Can you pull it? There you go. It's All got right. wheels Roll on it. Thing out. The next one we got to help you carry Don't. off whoever wins. Don't lose those Mountain Dews. All right. Y'all ready for the next one? One, zero. <laughs> one, zero, four, six, four, zero, one. Six, four, four zero, zero, one. one. Yes, oh, there. sir. All right. Hey, All Pastor, right. you get some double stuff later. Yes, sir. We'll have those this afternoon. Yeah. So how you want to do this, Grandpa? Pose. Just pose for the camera. <laughs> we'll come bring it. We'll bring it to you. You just pose. I'll bring yeah, it to you gotcha. afterwards. Right. There's a $10 delivery fee. Pastor Chuck said he'll bring it. Yeah, uh, yeah, them double subs, they're going to be gone, I'm just going to say. All right, it's the last one okay. right here, the big ticket item right here. Now, this comes with an assembly charge. Whoever wins it owes me $50. <laughs> Actually, an hour, so $150. All right. So. All right. Let's see. We'll work it out. Who needs a grill? Anybody? Yeah, a couple of y'all. Julian, you, your dad... You, you need one? He has like 12, 12 grills over there. But you can't get one. 
All right, 104, 64, 04. 6404. 6404. Hey, Mr. Carlos. Mr. Carlos. All yes, right. Sir. Yes, sir. For you, I'll break a deal. Instead of $150 assembly fee, $100. <laughs> it says it, 6404. So we'll come, we'll get together after service and we'll work it out. Take it to your house, he said. Just deliver it. <laughs> we'll do. We'll get it there. All right. All right so, uh, just going to close it out. Guys, we uh, fathers, particularly on this day, we, we thank you for bringing your families to church. Amen. Just as pastor's been preaching, it starts in our home, and it starts with the Father. So we thank you all so much. You want us to go ahead? We'll pray and dismiss you all, and we want you all to have a great afternoon for everybody, not just the Father. So, Lord, we just thank you for our, our service today. We thank you that you have a fire in our pastor and that he's just sharing that um, that fire with the, the people that you have called to here to New Harvest Church to clue us into this region, God. And we just thank you that from this fire, you'll, we'll see that revival. So, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in this, this house, in this city. And we want you to get to glory and be glorified through everything, God. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. We love y'all. Have a great afternoon.